Good afternoon. Welcome to today's webinar, Safety in Field Sports and Courts. During today's program, a presenter will cover the following, the standard of care versus the standard of practice in recreational activities, standards, buffer zones with fields and courts, signage, signage issues with recreational areas, and recreational fencing issues with fields. Today's webinar will feature Tom Bowler. Tom is an expert witness for attorneys throughout the United States. He consults on litigation matters involving physical education, athletics, and recreation. Over the last 18 years, Tom has consulted on 285 cases for both plaintiff and defense attorneys. Tom received his Bachelor of Science in Physical Education from the University of Connecticut a Master's of Education from Springfield College, and a Certificate of Advanced Graduate Studies from the University of Connecticut. If you have a question that pertains to this presentation, please use the Q&A or chat features, which are located on the right-hand side of the screen, signaling them with my pointer right now. Tom will do his best to answer your questions during the two Q&A breaks that we'll be taking during today's program. Tomorrow morning, I will send out an email with a link to the archive recording of the webinar, and I do ask that you take time to fill out the survey that will appear on your screen after the program is over. I now invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy. I'm going to turn the presentation over to our distinguished presenter, Tom Bowler. Tom, it is all yours. Thank you, Matt. Uh, hopefully, everyone can hear me. Uh, certainly, I can't see your faces. However, I'm sure that we'll have an enthusiastic audience out there today and hopefully this will be enlightening to everyone. As Matt has indicated, we have uh, some areas that we'd like to explore this afternoon, mainly the standard of care versus the standard of practice, standards in recreation, buffer zones, signage issues with recreational areas, fence issues with fields, and then I'll go into a summary. Uh, certainly we can't cover all situations in today pertaining to risk management uh, in fields and courts um, with a limited uh, time frame we have, obviously. However, we will cover uh, certainly the standard of care and standard of practice. I want to give you a quick and dirty definition right now that most of you probably have some form of uh, this definition from your background, obviously, and uh, it works for me, and sometimes there's a mis- connotation I feel uh, about the standard of care and standard of practice. And, and I use this one, it's by I believe two attorneys that I picked up uh, a number of years ago. Uh, the standard of care is the minimum acceptable conduct or performance related to a given activity or relationship. Um, as opposed to the standard of practice, again by the same two attorneys uh, that drafted this uh, definition, the standard of practice may or may not rise to the minimum level of care required by a given activity. And we'll give you an example of this in just a moment. Let's take a, an actual case that I had a number of years ago involving uh, the recreational activity of horseshoes. And uh, here you see the standard of practice. Uh, in this particular case, it was a, a gentleman that owned a, a large complex for uh, corporate uh, outings. And here you see a three-sided horseshoe pit with a stake in the middle and uh, more or less stone dust as the base. Well, there's a number of things wrong with this from the standard of practice versus the standard of care. Uh, first of all, please note the three-sided figure. Uh, certainly the backboard would be to contain the horseshoes and the sideboards from rolling around. Um, However, this would not comply with the National Horseshoe Pictures Association, the NHPA, rules because they do not recommend having uh, sideboards uh, on their courts. Uh, also, the stone dust would not be recommended because there would be some sort of a mixture of a clay kind of substance for the horseshoe. So this would be the standard practice, an example of the standard practice uh, in a particular lawsuit versus the standard of care. Here you see almost a textbook version of what horseshoe uh, boxes should look like. And you see the various stakes all lined up in a row, two inches off center, pitched toward the thrower. 
Uh, you see the backstop, one single backstop, backboard. Uh, the pit conforms with length, which would be somewhere in the vicinity of 72 inches to 43 inches in length. It would conform to the width, which would be 31 to 36 inches in width. And the backboard, probably just a skosh off due to the milling of the wood, but this was actually measured by being as 11 and a half inches. It should be 12 inches. Uh, so here you have a textbook uh, situation that was m made out of actually an old bituminous blacktop basketball court, and they dug out the park and rec department here, dug out the pits uh, to provide a recreational activity for uh, the city uh, towns folks. So here you have a, a good example of the standard of care versus the previous uh, slide that we looked at versus the standard of practice. Going into what constitutes in the recreational area and athletic area, physical education area documents, we have one of the main providers, the American Society for Testing and Materials International, and they're located on 100 Bar Harbor Drive in West Koshikok and PA, which I'm sure many of you, if you're signed on in the Philadelphia area, uh, know of this group. However, talking to classes when I go out to lecture, and many times uh, even to attorneys, I find that they're not even aware that this group exists. And this has a wealth of material as far as promulgating standards within the area. For example, just within the recreational, physical education, athletic area, let me list for you some of the standards that are out there. For example, they have standards on archery products, athletic footwear, baseball and softball equipment, bicycles, body padding, camping soft goods, eye safety for sports, fitness products, gymnastic and wrestling equipment, headgear and helmets, ice hockey, miscellaneous playing surfaces, paintball and equipment. Paintball, is a, I haven't had any cases with paintball. I went to uh, put myself out there as an expert on paintball. However, uh, as many of you recognize, uh, being attorneys, there's a considerable amount of litigation in the paintball uh, area, but they do have a stand on paintball and equipment. And they have various sport facilities, skate parks, ice hockey, roller hockey, and trampolines, just to mention a few. So that is an excellent group to go towards uh, if you're seeking a particular standard that will help you in a litigation matter. And they're revised every five years, as many of you know, otherwise they go out of existence. Rule books uh, create standards for us, certainly the National Collegiate Athletic Association, the NCAA. The National Federation of State High School Associations, the NSHS, if it's abbreviated by its acronym, uh, they are very helpful in high school sports. Professional literature, such as Parks and Recreation Magazine, developed by the National Recreation and Park Association. The Journal of Physical Education, Recreation, and Dance, developed by the American Alliance for Health, Physical Education, Recreation, and Dance. Uh, Tom Sawyer's book on facility planning and design for health, physical activity, recreation, and sports in its 12th edition. I would recommend this book highly for any of you out there that have a considerable amount of litigation in the uh, sporting field area, particularly involving facilities. It's uh, more or less the Bible in the, in the field, and certainly it uh, has uh, been written by some of the best minds in the country as far as the various chapters. And uh, it is always updated every few years, and it has the best information as far as playgrounds, as far as uh, baseball fields, as far as uh, indoor courts such as basketball and so forth. Uh, one of the best best books, in my mind, in, in, the, in the country. Uh, moving along, we'd like to talk and, and center our uh, focus a little bit on buffer zones. Uh, and I'll give you my definition of what a buffer zone is. Uh, that would be the area around a field or a court where no obstructions exist and rule books will define the buffer zone or the safety zone necessary for fields or courts. Let me give you some examples. Uh, softball fields, for example, should be set back 25 feet from the baselines as far as any obstruction to any kind of fencing. Uh, football fields, uh, the perimeter of the field should be set back for the obstruction 15 feet or 5 yards. Uh, soccer fields, 10 feet, and I don't really feel sometimes 10 feet it would be very, very adequate uh, since you have for a football, feet, uh, for a football field 15 feet. However, uh, the rule book does indicate 10 feet 
uh, set back from instructions for soccer fields. And then you have the infamous basketball courts in most rule books. Uh, uh, it would say three to ten feet. In most facilities books, it would say six to ten feet from the bleachers and the walls. And we'll get into that a little bit later in just a moment. But, uh, I'd like to talk about that. Uh, let's go into some specific fact patterns now with some of the cases I had, and maybe some of these would relate to some of the cases you are having now. I'd like to talk about a softball case and involving lack of the appropriate buffer zone or safety zone, if you will. It involved the fact pattern of a female who was 33 years of age in a recreational league in a city, and she was playing the position of catcher. Uh, and this was in slow pitch softball. And a foul ball came back, and she attempted to catch it near the screen, the wire mesh screen, and her left foot became entangled in the curled fence. Uh, the injury result was a fracture, and she had nine screws in her ankle. The issues for me, basically, was maintenance of backstop because they allow this curling to happen, and this will happen uh, typically with baseball and softball fences because uh, with the age of the fence, also with uh, athletes batting the ball into the fence, it tends to bow out and it curls at the bottom. And if it's not wired appropriately at the bottom and kept maintained, it can create a, a hazard. Uh, so the maintenance of backstop was a concern of mine, as well as I asked the attorney when I first initially got the case, was the setback appropriate? He said, well, I don't know. So I went down to look at the uh, setup of the foul line, uh, third base in particular, to the backstop, and it was less than 25 feet. Uh, and, of course, we have the AFTM standard, F2000. I didn't put the year. Usually, as you know, there's a hyphen, and it will say 05 or 04, and that will indicate the year. I didn't do it in this particular case. But the standard would indicate uh, no less, the ASTM standard, no less than 25 feet for softball uh, setbacks. And the uh, ruling from the, Amer uh, the Amateur Softball Association rulebook, ASA, Amateur Softball Association rulebook, would indicate the same thing, the minimum setback of 25 feet. Uh, so, therefore... Uh, we had a situation here where we can cite two standards in either a written report or in a deposition that uh, this was not in conformance. And here you see the young lady posing for me. She was still, when I met up with her a number of years ago, it was August uh, when she injured herself. I met with her in November, so it was three or four months post-injury, and she was still hobbling around with one crutch, and she was demonstrating for me specifically how this injury took place stepping on the curled fence at the bottom. This photograph does not illustrate terribly well the uh, curling, uh, but you have to trust me that that's where she uh, had the, the incident. Uh, certainly nine screws, uh, life certainly uh, occurring injury that would uh, certainly uh, probably impact her for the rest of her, her life. Uh, and certainly this could have been avoided by one, number one, maintenance, and number two could have been avoided very, very easily by having an appropriate setback so the fencing was not as close to the field. We'll move on. I think uh, Matt is going to have some questions a little bit later in the in the discussion for us. Uh, uh, let's move ahead to uh, talk about another buffer zone type of situation here with a concrete wall containment barrier uh, involving a football injury. And the uh, fact pattern basically uh, indicated that it was a lease facility approximately 100 years old. And the, had, they had upgrades to the football stadium, so I couldn't really go out and, and visit in the far west this particular stadium because, uh, uh, the facts had changed, so it would make no sense for me to go out and actually look at the football stadium. Uh, the receiver went out for a pass, as well as the defender, uh, trying to defend against him. You'll see that in a moment. Uh, the concrete wall encircled the entire stadium. The problem was the concrete wall was only three and a half feet off the corner of the football uh, layout, uh, off the end zone. And they had padded the portion of the wall there in the corners. And the receiver and defender hit the wall at top speed. So basically in my report I cited the lack of the appropriate buffer zone, the five-yard minimum that we talked about before, and I referenced the National Federation rulebook on that, high school uh, association rulebook, 
as well as Tom Sawyer's Facility Planning and Design book. So those are the two standards that I was looking at in looking at my report. And here you see the actual collision with the wall. Uh, you note, please, that the yellow padding to the far uh, left corner, in the middle of your screen to the far left, uh, there's a player in white uh, that is impacting. It is, he's doubled over backwards. He had just impacted the wall. There's another player standing up in a black uniform. I know it's kind of grainy. You can't see it all that well, but the defender is impacting the wall as well. So they recognized, obviously, in the corners this was an issue by padding it, uh, but you could see the uh, multi-purpose use of the field. They're using it for track, number one. They're using it for soccer. You can see the overlap of soccer, I think, for the corner kick area. You can see the overlap for the uh, football field. And in this corner, it was three and a half feet, which is woefully inadequate for a football field. Uh, we know that, you know, players are going to go out of bounds by just trying to catch a pass. And he hit it at breakneck speed. See, in looking at the DVD, he was running as hard as he possibly could, as well as the defender. And he just crumpled like a rag doll when he hit it, in spite of the fact that the uh, padding was there. A very unfortunate uh, uh, injury. Soccer fields, again, need buffer zones, and this is just showing a goal in soccer, but certainly the sidelines around the field, totally around the field, would need uh, 10 feet of free space away from any kinds of benches, any kinds of obstructions, of, uh, of any kind of water fountains that might be sticking up, uh, uh, as far as uh, any kinds of uh, permanent benching and so forth. Uh, you would need uh, at least 10 feet uh, for your soccer uh, facilities. Let's talk about the typical buffer zone litigation you get in a basketball case, a particularly indoor venue. And uh, certainly it usually occurs in older uh, facilities. Uh, the end lines are many times too close to the walls. Um, no padding is afforded to the players, or if the padding is afforded, it's very minimal. Uh, it results in the typical injury either to the head or the arm. And the remedies would be to modify the court end lines, uh, certainly by sanding down or refinishing the floor and putting the court, uh, certainly might not be a regulation, but if it's used for a physical education venue, not a full-size course for uh, competitive basketball games, I see no reason why it can't be shortened. Uh, obviously, the backboards would have to be appropriately placed on the court. Uh, provide sufficient padding. And I think that's the operative word here, sufficient padding. Uh, certainly, many times the padding is woefully inadequate. It's not uh, meeting uh, the needs of the players. Uh, years ago, we would pad the lane only. Now, we seem to be trending toward the situation of uh, padding the entire uh, end line uh, uh, wall of the gym, as well as also there's a trend toward uh, padding the sidelines. Uh, three feet around the boundary, at least three feet, they will say the rule books, is, is uh, required around the boundary of the court, and it's preferred that it would be 10 feet. But guess what? In 1966, 44 years ago, a facilities book was mentoring the same type of situation as a standard, three feet at least and 10 feet preferred. That was 44 years ago. So we haven't moved since 1966 to 2010, we haven't moved in this direction of realizing the fact that we must do something about this uh, inadequate standard, in my opinion. Uh, certainly, uh, people are getting hurt. Uh, I read recently in an article uh, where a father had to, after three or four months of his youngster hitting a wall in a gymnasium, had to take him off life support because he just couldn't go on any further. Uh, it was uh, a traumatic brain injury to the, the student. Uh, so we have recognized that certainly the three to five, three to ten feet, excuse me, three to ten feet uh, distance has been inadequate for many, many years, but we have done nothing about it. And most informed risk managers would realize this and would agree with me. Um, and again, the operant word would be sufficient padding and reconfiguring the court. And by the way, the ASTM does have a standard uh, for wall padding. And um, I, many of you should look into that if you have cases involving uh, um, 
reports uh, about an athletes and so forth, uh, it would be well to, to well advised to look into that particular standard. Uh, and here you see the typical uh, situation. We have a basketball court, an old gymnasium, maybe the backboard sticking out from the wall, maybe 18 inches, 20 inches. Uh, you see the padding. They try to pad the uh, end line. And what they have done, uh, they haven't just padded the lane area, they padded the whole width of the gym. And they also wrapped it around and started going the other way toward the sidelines, which uh, uh, certainly is the way that we're trending uh, in today's uh, situation. Um, so we are going in that direction. I know in my hometown here, they made a point with all the elementary schools to uh, start padding all four walls. And this was going back maybe... Oh, uh, five, six years ago, I believe, at least, uh, they phased it in that they made it as their objective uh, uh, each year to uh, phase in a couple of the uh, gymnasiums to make them uh, safer. Uh, because we have to realize it's not only used for basketball, it's used for many other things, gymnasiums, many times. And just to pad the lane or even just to pad one end of the gym uh, is foolhardy because we know that students are going to be moving about in all four walls, and around all four walls, and could impact any of those walls at any time. So if it's a multi-purpose use facility, not just for basketball, for physical education, and many games that that would entail, we need to obviously uh, take into account that uh, perhaps all four walls would be padded. And the amount of money expended for those channels, you'll see it's typically done in channels. It's not done with a mat just hung or suspended it behind the backboard. Uh, but it's done in channels, and they're fixed uh, to the wall. Uh, basically, a channel mat, maybe two feet by six feet tall, uh, would be in the order of maybe $100 for each channel, something of that variety. So uh, certainly be well to, to look into that uh, area. Uh, if a school district was looking to keep themselves safer. Uh, getting back to the standard of care for just a minute, uh, I was involved in a case in, in New York State once. I won't mention the city or town. Uh, but uh, it was an elementary uh, case involving a basketball uh, physical education class where they were playing two-on-two -two basketball. And there wasn't one scrap of padding in the uh, intermediate grade level, uh, four, five, and six, I believe it was. There wasn't one scrap of padding. But the attorney called me up and he said, hey, Tom, guess what we discovered? We discovered there was another basketball uh, facility, another uh, basketball court gymnasium in this same elementary school. Would you come down and take a look at it? Went to that area, which was for K through three, I believe, kindergarten through grade three, and that did have padding. So in the same facility, we had a double standard of care. We had uh, one gym for the kindergarten through grade three having some padding involved, uh, quite a bit of padding actually on some of the walls, um, and in the other facility upstairs, uh, the gymnasium. There exists there's not one scrap of padding. So double standard, they recognized it in one gym, certainly they needed to be safe, and they recognized the hazard, they did pad it, uh, put up the appropriate padding, and the other gymnasium, there was no padding whatsoever. So it made an interesting double standard, and we argued that point in our, our report, or at least I did. Uh, baseball case uh, involving a male that was 18 years old, a back pattern in an American Legion game, he was a right fielder who ran into a six-foot-high chain-link fence attempting to catch a home run. He uh, had an elbow fracture. Uh, basically, I uh, cited the lack of a warning track, and the fence height was inadequate. Again, I was citing Tom Sawyer, who was the editor of the Facilities Planning and Design book, and I was also citing an ASTM standard F2000, which indicates an eight-foot-high fence should be uh, used at a, at a baseball area. Uh, and here you see the exact area, uh, right field, uh, grass completely to the to the fence, and only a six foot high fence. And uh, many times it's done for, for ease. Uh, we grow grass to the fence because it's easier to maintain that way instead of maintaining a clay uh, surface out there. Uh, it's easier for the lawnmowers to go right up to the fence instead of trying to pick out all the weeds. And as the seasons go by, it becomes more of a problem to get them back into condition again. The fields uh, after the seasons roll by, if it's just used for baseball, solely for baseball, to get it back into shape for a, another um, season. Uh, so it's a convenience, I think, to the operator many times. Uh, Six-foot fences uh, put people at risk because 
the clavicle, the shoulder area, and so forth, the elbow area, the head, uh, certainly is uh, prime with that cross piece bar, the cross member bar going across. So by raising it the extra additional two feet, at least you'd be hitting uh, chain. You wouldn't be hitting uh, the wire mesh. You wouldn't be hitting the uh, pipe, the galvanized pipe, and that uh, is certainly uh, uh, an issue here. Uh, I think we're going to stop for questions now. Right? Take a question and answer break, right, Tom? Uh, yes, that would be good yeah. right now. Okay, excellent. We have a question here from Ryan who asks, uh, you referenced the NFHS as a body providing regulations for high school sports. Do you know of any association or agency providing regulation for club sports not associated with the school, such as a travel hockey club? Uh, no, I don't offhand. I don't know any other uh, organization out there uh, as far as uh, uh, club sports. The only one that comes to mind immediately, but it's at the college, collegiate level, would be the um, National Intramural Recreation and Sport Association. But that's at the uh, you know doing uh, sports at uh, collegiate level and, and you know club sports and so forth uh, and intramural sports. They would have some uh, uh, you know books and, and information on that, but I don't know anything uh, from his standpoint. He's talking about, I assume, a travel uh, a team that's associated with a club with a high school. I don't know of any that would have uh, regulation over that, any kind of uh, organization that would have auspices over that. Okay, great. Uh, we have a question here from Heidi who asks, can the addition of padding legally mitigate a lack of adequate buffer zone? i.e., can one meet the standard of care by adding padding even if they can't provide the required buffer distance? It would help, and that's, that's basically the remedy that most schools would be using to mitigate the uh, lack of distance. They would be padding it, but um, certainly the padding has to be appropriate. If you're putting padding there that's falling apart, I recently had a case where a whole seam was falling off uh, of the padding, and... Uh, the attorney is trying to tell me for the defendant that this is this is appropriate. They provided padding, but if it's falling apart and it's antiquated and old and has slits in it and it has uh, the old uh, cloth ties in it that's pulling it together, that's going to certainly minimize the uh, padding. The padding has to conform uh, to basically the playground standard, which is uh, 200 Gs of force or less because it's meant for the, the head, which is the most vulnerable part of the body. Uh, so basically the wall padding uh, is predicated on the playground uh, standard that we had many years ago when a head form struck uh, the surface and it has to absorb shock uh, of the attenuation of 200 Gs or less. Anything above 200 Gs is going to cause a serious head injury. Uh, so certainly padding will help, but we have to recognize the fact uh, that uh, basically, it has to be the appropriate padding. A lot of padding will bottom out uh, somewhere between 7 and 15 years of age. Uh, it probably would have to be replaced. That's probably the life of, of padding. You have to recognize there's two types of padding. There's an open cell and a closed cell. And, you know, we can get into a whole discussion probably just doing a, a webinar on padding. But, uh, yes, it, it will help. But, again, uh, certainly I feel that the spacing has to be as adequate as, as well. But padding will help. But if you're asking someone to crash into a, a pad that's only four feet away from a wall, uh, the end line, then, you know, certainly they can be impacting that pad and can bottom out and it can still, still can create a great deal of risk. Also, padding, I think, gives the athletes a four false sense of safety because they feel, well, I got the pad there, I can crash into that, and nothing's going to happen to me, and that's, again, not, not true because you can bottom out, and, and certainly you can have a serious fracture of the arm or a serious concussion or whatever. Okay, great. Uh, please keep the great questions coming in. Uh, we have another question here, Tom, that has to do with the sport of volleyball. Um, with regard to the sport of volleyball, is out of bounds actually in play with regard to the buffer zone? Uh, yes, it is, and that's why when you have a typical court of volleyball, you just don't play in the uh, four perimeter lines. Obviously, uh, people will go for a bump outside the lines and so forth, and so you have to take into account that out-of-bounds is still in place, so you have to provide a greater area there so there won't be uh, obstruction. So that, that, that's very, very important to, to know that and to provide that. Okay, great. I don't see any more questions uh, in the queue, so... 
Um, if you're in attendance and would like to ask Tom a question, we are going to be taking a second Q&A break. Uh, so use the chat feature or the Q&A feature uh, to submit them. But, uh, Tom, I think we're good to go to continue on with the presentation. Okay, then. Uh, also, I'd like to talk about a couple of uh, obstruction kinds of issues on outdoor courts now, on basketball courts that typically you will have in, in litigation matters. And this uh, next slide, uh, slide 20, uh, appears at an elementary uh, school. And here you see an old, outdated uh, basketball full court situation. And the blue bag is just probably my tool bag that I left on the on the uh, court when I was doing my investigation. But off to the left, you see a single white pole uh, with an orange funnel, which is a, a funnel ball. And typically, uh, children at elementary schools have funnel balls where they'll be shooting at a large funnel, and the balls will come out one of four types of shoots. And many times they could be labeled plus one, minus one, so the children can do a little math as they're going along. And uh, nice idea, certainly, to have a lot of uh, activities for recess out there. But in this particular case, the young man was playing full court, unfortunately, and ran into or dribbled into the funnel ball and had some serious dental work uh, had to be performed on him after the injury. Uh, initially, when I got the case, the attorney was uh, promulgating to me uh, that, gee, you know, this boy was shooting at the funnel ball and he bumped his head on it and had some dental work that had to be done. Shouldn't a funnel ball be padded? And I tried to tell him, well, you know, I'll take a look at it, but it's not terribly practical. You'd have to have someone take the padding in, take the padding out. It will get vandalized. Um, the ultraviolet rays certainly will affect padding. Uh, the rain, the snow, the ice, and so forth, and northern climates will help, you know, affect this. Uh, when I met up with the boy, I said, let me see what you're doing. I took him over to the funnel ball and uh, gave him the basketball. He was met his mom there. And uh, instead of take a shot, he took a shot. And he turned to me and he says, I wasn't doing this at all. I said, what were you doing? He said, I was playing full court basketball. Uh, to make a long story short, I called the attorney the next Monday after I met with the boy on a Saturday. And I said, uh, I think we have actually a stronger case here. Uh, Certainly, uh, a boy playing on a court where we have an obstruction creates, for me, a, a better fact pattern. He said, gee, I never had a case where the facts really got better for me. And uh, we went from there, and I was deposed on the case. It was settled out of court. But uh, uh, interestingly enough, we should not have other kinds of activities going on with steel pipes or galvanized pipes on a basketball court, in particular if that's meant for full court. Or we have to limit what we're doing out there with a the supervisor, and that becomes a supervisory issue. Either you play funnel ball or you play full court basketball, but that has to be in a sleeve. We take out the funnel pipe uh, uh, when it's not being used as a funnel ball activity and let them play full court basketball, but you can't have both going on at the same time. Another situation, a large uh, New England city, a little bit different scenario, but the same kind of uh, uh, theme going on here. We have on the very outside line, you'll see to the far right in the middle of the screen, a white line which depicts the basketball court. But on the inner part, you'll see a rectangle that depicts the volleyball court. So we have circumscribed inside the basketball court, the smaller volleyball court. But then if you notice to the right side of the orange dot in the very middle of your screen, there is a galvanized pipe and the base is a rectangle concrete base which is clearly embedded. This is not in a sleeve. This is not to be taken in and out. The city, what they did in their wisdom, put in a galvanized pipe for volleyball and left it there. And you can imagine what happened. Someone playing basketball dribbled right into the galvanized pipe. Uh, so, again, if you're going to have multi-use uh, purposes for courts, uh, certainly you should be uh, having sleeves in the ground and take them out of the ground when you're not using them for volleyball and uh, open it up for basketball. And if you're using it only for volleyball, it should be monitored in those sleeves and pipes should be taken out. But this was not in a sleeve situation. This was uh, something that was clearly cemented into the ground and uh, certainly uh, uh, was something that uh, anybody can recognize was, was dangerous. Uh, the two doctrines here that many of you recognize would be the doctrine of the exception theory or distraction theory by the plaintiff. When someone who gets hurt in a situation like this, uh, immediately uh, the plaintiff attorney will say that, gee, you know, the 
participant has been there numerous times, but they were distracted because they were going for uh, the basketball. They were dribbling the basketball. Their head was down. They weren't looking where they're going. Uh, they were getting the pass and looking toward the person giving them the pass. Where the, as you recognize, many of you, the defendant attorney will argue this is open and obvious. The person has been there. They should have recognized the fact that this was there and they should not have run into the pipe. Uh, obstruction should be removable. As I said, there should be sleeves in the ground. And if courts are used for multi-purposes, we should not have things permanently affixed into the ground where uh, athletes will be getting hurt. We're going to move a little bit into the area of uh, wire meshing and fencing and, and bleachers. Uh, talk about that because, again, our time is limited and we can't talk about all kinds of injuries and all kinds of risk management uh, problems in the area of athletics, physical education, and recreation. But I chose uh, three or four themes here this afternoon to get to that are common uh, to uh, recreational injuries. Um, Spectator injuries on football stands and bleacher injuries are uh, many times due to slip and fall or slip and trip incidents. Uh, jumping off bleachers uh, uh, can be a, a problem for, for young students or slipping between the uh, treads and so forth. Uh, falls off of bleachers uh, can be problems. And the participant injuries certainly are mostly due to running into bleachers. Here's another fact pattern with a spectator uh case involving a fencing issue, uh, uh, involving bleachers actually, it, it related around a high school student in a high school baseball game, and bleacher seats were used really as the aisle to go up and down, or at least she was using them that way. She was sliding her right hand along the top rail member, and she got to the very bottom uh, stair, in her opinion, or seat as it would be, and the salvage was not maintained or installed properly. Her pinky finger was amputated, unfortunately, and basically maintenance and installation problems existed here. And I cited the standard of the ASTM standard F567 and the Consumer Product Safety Commission. It would be two uh, areas, certainly, to um, look towards uh, uh, in this particular uh, case. And here you see the salvage not uh, being crimped over properly, and it was basically probably... Uh, not installed properly. Uh, the company that did the installation was cited in this case, as well as uh, the maintenance of the uh, local school board uh, for not picking up on this. And here you see something that would be more appropriate. Uh, crimped down, you can see all the uh, tines there are crimped over, or what we call in the fencing industry, knuckled down, uh, and certainly that would be appropriate. Uh, before we get off the, the whole bleacher issue, recently here in, in New England, actually, actually in Connecticut, I won't mention the town or city, uh, but it happened within the past week, a tree limb fell on some bleachers here. And uh, basically two girls and a woman were, were injured. They were sitting on the bleachers watching a Little League game. Uh, so I would indicate that towns have to be very vigilant and uh, looking above bleachers, if they're in the shaded areas, and pruning, taking out any dead branches, if there's a tree that is dying or diseased, uh, taking down a tree entirely before they fall on spectators. It's uh, very, very important that the Park and Rec Department get involved, the Public Works Department gets involved, and certainly this is uh, something that uh, should be done. So uh, I, I'm sure probably uh, we might see a lawsuit probably developing from this uh, with a tree falling on uh, two girls and two women. For, unfortunately, they weren't uh, seriously injured, I don't believe, from, from the account. Uh, here you see a, an outfield fence, again, the height of it six feet, and again, it would be eight feet for the, the uh, height of the backstop, or the height of the fence, rather. The elementary school backstop case that I brought before you today is a fact pattern of a child climbing on a backstop at recess, and she raked her hand across the top of the uh, fence. The fence salvage was not knuckled over. Uh, the fence was in disrepair because you'll see the wire in a moment uh, laced through it to help re repair it. And the uh, fence guard or the cap was lacking on the top. And many times what uh, you'll see a baseball field, or uh, little league fields, uh, uh, not so much on backstops, but uh, the fencing in particular, they will put a guard over the top of it to uh, uh, show basically where the top is for indicating home run balls and so forth, but also to protect from getting hurt on the top of fencing. 
Improper maintenance and improper supervision was cited in this case, and I cited the ASTM reference standard F2000 for fencing. And, and basically, uh, we'll, we'll just go to this before we have the chat session again. Uh, notice the dangerous condition here that you have the uh, tines uh, sticking up. You have uh, over on the left-hand side someone makeshift, try to keep the fence up by putting a loop. And the whole backstop in this case, in my opinion, should have been taken down. It's rusting. It's dangerous. And the girl was climbing, again, a supervision issue here by allowing him to climb on a backstop, and she raked her hand and got a severe laceration from one of those metal tines sticking out. I think we'll probably break, maybe, if we have any questions at this time, Matt, for any more questions at this point. Uh, we do have a couple questions, yeah. Uh, we do have a question uh, here that asks, uh, what liability is there for injuries for sprinklers on a field? That is something that I haven't become that familiar with, but I know it is a problem because uh, you'll have the sprinklers that uh, will pop up, and uh, if they're not installed properly, uh, if they're protruding too much above grade, uh, you know, twist an ankle or trip hazards, I haven't had any litigation matters uh, come before me, I don't believe, uh, citing that as a problem. But I know it has come up in previous lectures of mine that uh, people have asked about that. And certainly we need the fields to be irrigated, and uh, certainly they need to be out there. It's the trick of designing them such that they're flush with the ground and they pop up and they recede into the ground, so they're not going to become trip hazards. But as we all know, they can be trip hazards if they're, uh, allowed to protrude uh, into, uh, you know, the space of the field where they are protruding above, the, you know, the grade of the uh, field itself. Okay, great. Here is another question. Uh, should outdoor basketball standards for basketball goals be padded for safety? Ideally, they should be, uh, but certainly uh, if, you know, the, the ultraviolet rays, as I mentioned before, and by the, you need someone to take them in and out, uh, but ideally, they really should be padded. Uh, the standard of care would indicate that they really should be padded. But the secret is, of uh, at nighttime, obviously, you have to take them in. You have to take them back out in the morning first thing. They're used for recreational purposes. Uh, you know, they could be vandalized and so forth. We have to realize the reality of the situation. But uh, for the standard of care, um, yes, they should be padded, the outdoor bows. And then a... Uh, Kind of a follow-up to that. Uh, what is the uh, trend today for wall padding for gymnasiums? Uh, the trend, we're trending toward, uh, in my opinion, uh, many of your elementary schools are going for all four walls being padded. And uh, that's a trend that we see in many elementary schools, even middle schools. Uh, maybe not so much in high schools uh, because we have the bleacher issue, but I was even in a high school about five, six years ago where they even padded the bleachers, believe it or not. Uh, so we're trending toward, toward that whole situation of at least padding the entire uh, end lines of the gymnasium, not just the uh, lane for the uh, uh, foul shots, uh, but we're also padding the sidelines as well, and, and that seems to be the trend in, within the industry right now. It, it certainly is a costly factor, but when we're using the gyms for multi-purposes, as I've indicated before, that we have to take into account that it's not just used as a basketball facility, it's used for many other purposes. Okay, great, Tom. Thank you. I don't see any other questions in the queue, so why don't we continue on with the presentation? Okay. We'd like to talk a little bit about signage because signage is something that uh, all gymnasiums usually have and outdoor venues usually have in their recreational areas. And the typical, of course, is the state and fire local laws and the ordinances involving the capacity of a gym and uh, the fire laws and so forth. Uh, and the occupancy beyond that is unlawful. So here you see a typical uh, uh, sign that would exist in a gymnasium. Here you see a recreational sign outside for a playground area. If you find a needle, do not touch it, find an adult. And obviously this was in a, a town or city that had a, a problem with uh, uh with drugs and so forth, with needles, and uh, uh, obviously you want to warn the parents and children about it so the children can read, uh, obviously they're attending uh, this playground. But uh, certainly uh, warning signs are, are very, very important. I found this a little bit humorous. Uh, here you see a large city, uh, very, very high fence. It's on top of a wall, actually, and danger keep out, no water in pools. But on top of the fence, you see a razor wire. 
and uh, certainly I, I would have to guess that uh, you're gonna you know you're gonna cut yourself up to smithereens probably before you even get to the pool by going over this fence. But uh, not to joke and make a light matter out of it, uh, certainly maybe there should have been a warning there on top of the fence as well that there's barbed wire up here, razor wire, and you're going to get hurt. Not just there's no water in the pool, uh, but I couldn't help but chuckle when I, I came upon this situation. Um, I'd like to talk about a case actually where signage might have had a large impact in actually swaying the case for the defendant, which unfortunately it did not. Uh, the fact pattern existed in, in a town in Florida. Uh, that I was involved in a, in a case as the defendant's expert witness a number of years ago. Uh, the fact in, facts involved in this case involved a male that was 13 jogging and stopped at a park, and he was wearing a T-shirt and some baggy workout shorts. He was jogging with his dad. Uh, he was using a swing when he stopped to jog, and he fell backwards, catching his workout shorts on the S hook that typically fastens the seat to the chain. It was dark outside, and there were lights in the park, and the fact, facts surrounding the time of year and so forth, it was after 6 o'clock in the evening, and it was January 7th of 2004, the incident date. Okay, now we flip to the next slide that actually shows the signage at the park. And uh, this is a picture that I took in this Florida town a number of years ago. It existed at the time of the injury as well, which was probably a year or two previous to me inspecting the park. But if you notice where it says park hours, it says 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. daylight saving time. And then it says 7.30 to 7.30 Eastern Standard Time. What happened in this particular case, for whatever reason, the sign maker for the Park and Recreation Department switched the daylight saving time with the Eastern Standard Time. For example, if we had the time correct here, the young man would have been in the park after 6 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. So Eastern Standard Time should have been from 7 o'clock to 6, and the daylight saving time should have been 7.30 to 7.30. So they interposed the two times and posted it that way. The young man was in the park basically at 6 o'clock. It was the Eastern Standard Time. He was there an hour and a half lawfully before the park closed, according to the sign. That's not what the intent of the sign was, or I'm sure what the intent of the sign was, that obviously daylight saving hours were extended longer, and if he was there after 6 o'clock, and if they had posted this correctly at the time, he was there unlawfully after 6 o'clock. So in this particular case, if the sign was written correctly, the defendant may have prevailed in this case, which we did not, unfortunately. But just a little example of a sign and making sure your signs are correct, they can have a large impact, as all of you know, on the outcome of a case. In summary, as we're getting close to time, at the end of time, I'm sure some of you have some more questions. Um, I tried to go through some lawsuits involving typical buffer zones. The basketball courts is a common one. Uh, you might get some in baseball, football as well, softball. Science helps to insulate, however, as most of you know, it does not eliminate all liability, but does help to insulate. I dare say in the Florida case, we might have been able to prevail as a defendant in that uh, case if it was written correctly. They didn't interpose the time and change the time, times on the sign. Uh, you have to know the standard of care within the industry, and it's helpful by knowing the uh, various standards out there. And I would dare say if, if some of you have not made yourself uh, knowledgeable about ASTM standards, or if this is new for you, then great, I've done my job. Uh, many of you probably do know that ASTM standards exist out there, but there's uh, not just in the uh, sports area, the athletic area, but in the playground area, it's very, very helpful too. Uh, there are There's a public playground standard, there's a home playground standard, there's a soft contained playground standard for the types that you see in Burger King and McDonald's and so forth. Uh, there's a attenuation standard. F1292. So there's many, many standards out there that uh, will help you with your playground cases, will help you with your athletic cases, and so forth. So uh, certainly uh, get familiar with ASTM. It's a great, great group. I believe it's only $75 to be a member, um, and it's a, a fantastic group to get involved with. Um, know the difference between the standard of care and, and standard of practice, which, which many of you do. Um, 
And uh, the horseshoe case that I mentioned before actually for me was a defending case, and actually I pointed out in the three-sided uh, arrangement uh, versus the actual National, National Horseshoe Pitchers Association that uh, the young man that was involved in this uh, was not there to uh, pitch for a world's record, uh, state record. Uh, he was just there to have uh, a corporate outing, and uh, uh, certainly the uh, owner of the premises was just there to provide some recreational activities, and he tried, even despite the fact that the National Horseshoe Pitchers Association uh, would not suggest having a three-sided uh, um, containment, uh, they were trying to obviously be safe. And what, basically what I did for the defendant attorney, I said to him, I will go out and check on 12 sites and see what I come up with. I checked 12 sites in Connecticut, and only two of the uh, 10 that I checked, I believe, or 12, uh, conformed. Um, so basically the majority did not conform with the National Horses Pitchers Association. So the standard of practice can prevail sometimes uh, depending on the, the situation uh, and the fact pattern of your case. Um, and lastly, I would suggest that you select the appropriate expert for a, a case. Uh, I am not an expert in all athletic areas, in all recreational areas by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, and be aware of your laundry listing experts that say they are. They'll, you'll come across, and I'm sure you all of you know this, they'll say, I can do aquatics, I can do winter sports, I can do uh, baseball, I can do softball, I can do wrestling, I can do skiing, I can do everything under the sun. And that person really is no expert at all, in my opinion. A uh, person has to have a, a narrow view, a uh, narrow uh, line of uh, view in their expertise, and they should keep to that, and certainly they shouldn't be out of their bounds. But if you have a person that's the you know, as one attorney put put it to me, you know, you put a quarter in, they'll they'll say anything. You know, the Nickelodeon expert, to put a quarter in, they'll play you back anything you want to hear of them here. Uh, then I I think you have to look for another expert. I don't know, Matt, if there's any time for for questions now. It's about five minutes, eight minutes to go. Maybe we have time for more questions. Oh uh, yeah, I did ask. Uh, we do have one one question here in the queue, and if any other um, attendees have a final question from Tom, uh, please use the chat feature, the Q and A feature. Uh, to submit them. Uh, to follow up on, um, I think, your second to last point, uh, we have a question here that asks, does the standard of practice ever prevail, in your opinion, within a lawsuit in recreational injuries? Yeah, I, I think uh, it, it can, um, depending on the fact pattern. Uh, uh, certainly in the horseshoe pitching case, uh, that was a situation that, uh, uh, you know, if you're looking at the, you know, 50 points or whatever it is to, to pitch a, a game of horseshoes, to win at a game of horseshoes uh, versus someone just going out and having, you know, chowder and having a beer or whatever and having fun at pitching horseshoes. It's a whole different uh, situation. And uh, certainly you don't want to be putting people at risk, putting them on, on even ground where they're going to be slipping and falling or having no containment barrier or whatever where the horseshoes would be rolling around. But in that particular case, uh, I believe the standard of care would prevail over the the standard of practice, excuse me, over the standard of care would prevail because the standard of practice would indicate that uh, many situations in horseshoe pitching um, would, for example, only provide maybe just two stakes. Uh, maybe they would provide um, a very similar situation. I found a very similar situation of a three-sided uh, containment barrier uh, existing in a park uh, in northern Connecticut. Uh, so many times... Uh, uh, the standard practice could prevail. Again, it depends, I believe, on the fact pattern of the case and uh, certainly what the person is uh, going for as far as the competitiveness of the event. If you're talking about uh, someone playing competitive athletics at the high school level versus someone that's just doing a pickup game, uh, certainly uh, you have to look at the fact pattern again and, and check it out. I'm not advocating that we lower our standards or lower our course, so they're dangerous. I'm not suggesting it at all, but I think uh, we have to, in this first year case, was a classic case for me just pointing out that, hey, you just don't need to have the own one sole backboard uh, to catch the horseshoes. You could have three, providing it's not dangerous, and uh, the National Horse Pitchers Association wouldn't advocate that, but the proprietor of this particular group was trying to do something that was very, very safe, and that was the bottom line to me. Okay, great. I don't see any other questions uh, in the chat queue or the question and answer queue. 
So I'm going to uh, start to wrap things up here. Uh, first, I want to thank Tom. Um, your presentation was uh, tremendous. It shows that you put a lot of thought and effort to, into it. And uh, on behalf of everybody in attendance, I want to thank you for that. I want to thank all who joined us today. Um, we do have um, – we know that you're taking an hour out of your business schedule, so uh, we do thank you. Um, Actually, Tom, I have a question that just came in to me um, from Al who asked, um, do you know any standards for indoor soccer fields? Uh, no, I don't. I don't have any uh, standards uh, that I can point to for indoor soccer fields. I know I had a case that uh, was a pending case for me a few years ago in New Jersey, and uh, a young man went into some netting and so forth and uh, I believe hit a wall beyond that. Uh, the only thing I could point to would be if it's an indoor situation, obviously check out the wall uh, padding standard for ASTM, but I don't have any particular kind of standard that I can point to specifically for indoor soccer, unfortunately, Matt and Al. Okay, thank you. Um, as I was saying, if you have a uh, – if you would like to speak to Tom about a specific case or question, a consulting project that you may have, uh, you can contact us here at TASA. Our telephone number is up on the screen. 1-800-523-2319. Uh, we will be sending out a link to the archive recording of this webinar tomorrow morning. Um, this and every archive recording of TASA webinars um, are posted in the Knowledge Center of the TASA website. That link is up on the screen as well. If you have any follow-up questions or comments, uh, you can feel free to email me at mhide at tassanet.com. I'll try to answer them as best as I can, and if they're specific to the presentation, I will certainly pass them along to Tom, and I know he will try to answer them as quickly as possible as well. Um, we do have another question, Tom, that came in as I was wrapping things up. Uh, would you like to Would you like to hear it? Sure. Okay. Who is liable for intentional torts in a, in athletic games such as soccer? In other words, an athlete is injured for an intentional purpose by another player? Well, again, I'm not an attorney, but I can interpret that. Uh, certainly, uh, the game has to be controlled by the officials, and uh, if they're allow allowing an intentional tort to take place by uh, purposely injuring another player, the game is in the hands of the official, and uh, if it gets out of hand, if they're, you know, rough play, you have to obviously nip that in the bud and uh, not allow that to prevail so it gets to that point. Um, obviously, in classic rivalries, there are going to be, you know, high emotions involved. But uh, I would say, at that point in time, the uh, the, uh, the the officials are are certainly in charge of the game. And obviously, any rough play in any kind of uh, football game, soccer game, whatever it might be, uh, should be curtailed before it gets to the point of someone physically, uh, you know, committing an intentional tour on another player, where they're physically injuring another player on purpose. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to wrap things up now. As I said, we will be sending out the link to the archive recording tomorrow morning. I will include the PowerPoint presentation used during today's program in that email. Um, if you have any additional questions that you'd like Tom to, to, to consider or if you have a case or project you'd like to consult with Tom on, uh, you can give us a call here and we'll get you his contact information as quickly as possible. Otherwise, I thank you for your time this afternoon. I look forward to seeing you at future TASA events. Thank you.